Our um, first talk in this group of three is going to be by Lauren Battelle. She's a PhD student at Duke, and she's actually in an environmental sciences program, but looking at carcinogens and their effect on malignancies. So my name is Lauren Battle, and the title of my talk today is The Effect of CYP1 Inhibition on the Toxicity and Biotransformation of Benzoipyrene and Fungal Heteroclitis. So this is just a brief outline of my talk. I'm going to give you a little bit of background and some information on the compounds that my lab studies, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, a little bit of information on the aryl hydrocarbon receptor on our study site on the Elizabeth River in Portsmouth, Virginia, and on our study organism, fungal heteroclitis. I'll then give you some results, some summary, and then leave some time for questions. So polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are a byproduct of organic combustion. They have a variety of natural and anthropogenic sources. Some of the natural sources are oil seeps, forest fires, volcanoes. But the sources that are of biggest concern are the anthropogenic sources, which are the man-made sources, in the production of coal and tar. Most human exposure is through consumption of foods that have been grilled or smoked, um, as well as through tobacco. Um, there are hundreds of PAHs, but seven of them are classified by the Environmental Protection Agency as probable human carcinogens, and many of them are agonists for the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. Probably the most well common, um, or the most common study PAH is benzoipyrene, and this is a compound of concern for both human and ecological health. Um, it's the main component in tobacco that is thought to be carcinogenic. And the parent compound itself is not toxic. However, it can be biotransformed in the Bay region or the K region of the compound um, in order to allow for its excretion. But in the process of its biotransformation, there's a uh, production of reactive metabolites that can then go on to form DNA addicts and can also form quinones, leading to reactive oxygen, the production of reactive oxygen species. So when benzoipyrene enters into the cell, it binds to the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, which is then able to be translocated into the nucleus. It dimerizes with um, ARNT, and then sits on xenobiotic response elements on a variety of genes, including many that are involved in metaboli metabolism, which are the cytochrome P450 um, family. And this, the genes that, the family that we study are um, CYP1, the family of CYP1. Um, and so these enzymes are then able to bind benzoipyrene and then metabolize it and allow for its excretion from the cell. So the main question of my thesis is what happens when you block CYP1 um, metabolism? What happens to the excretion of benzoipyrene? Does it go down an alternate pathway of metabolism? And what reactive metabolites might be formed? The reason why we study this is because for many years, my lab has studied a Superfund site on the Elizabeth River in Portsmouth, Virginia, which is a tributary off of the Chesapeake Bay. And here's our reference site, which is Kings Creek, which is also a tributary off of the York River. And the Elizabeth River has been home to um, the Atlantic Wood Industries, which shut down in 1990 and has now been a super classified as a Superfund site since 1990. And it was a wood treatment facility that used a compound called creosote that is a complex mixture of PAHs. And there were a variety of spills, and it's had devastating effects on the animal life at the site. So like I said, creosote is a complex mixture of PAHs, and the total pH concentration at the Elizabeth River in the sediment is 500 parts per million, which is one of the highest concentrations in the world. Um, at that site, benzoipyrene makes about 12% of that mixture, and the majority of the mixture is made up by fluoranthine, which makes up 26%. So fluoranthine is the most prevalent pH at a variety of contaminated sites, um, and it 
two, like benzoylpyrene, has low carcinogenic activity. However, it has very low affinity for the AHR, and unlike benzoylpyrene, it's a non-competitive inhibitor of CYP1A. So the animal that we study is fungalus heteroclitus, and this is a minnow that lives in the, is very abundant in the estuaries all along the East Coast. And the reason why we study is it has a transparent chorion, which allows you to look at embryonic development throughout development without harming the embryo. Um, it's very important in estuarine food webs, and there's a lot of information on it from an ecology, um, molecular biology development, and toxicology. And in my lab, we have um, established a scale in order to look at one specific deformity that we see in the fish, which is a cardiac deformity. And so just to give you some orientation, here are the eyes of the fish, the embryo. Its body is going kind of back into the screen and coming back around. Um, there's its tail. And so its heart in a normal fish, where we scale, we give it a zero. The, there's two distinguishable chambers of the heart, and they run parallel to the eyes. In this fish, which has been exposed to um, about a 1 to 20 dilution of the Elizabeth River sediment extract, you can see that the heart has started to shift. And in this fish, which has been exposed to a 1 to 4 dilution of the sediment extract, there are no longer distinguishable chambers, and there's no longer blood flow in that heart. And we give that heart a, a scale of 2. So I said that that happens to these fish when they're exposed to the Elizabeth River sediment, but there is a population of fish at the site which are resistant to the toxicity of the sediment. And they, even though they do suffer hepatic and extrahepatic lesions, um, the embryos don't die and the juveniles don't die when exposed to the sediment. And they're resistant, also resistant to a lot of peroxidants. And interestingly enough, these fish do not induce that metabolic enzyme. And so here is just a figure looking at Q, doing qPCR real time and looking at the RNA. And you can see in the Kings Creek adults, the males and females um, induce CYP1A after exposure to um, a PAH, while the Elizabeth River fish do not. So my question is, what is the role of CYP1 inhibition on the toxicity and biotransformation of BAP? And so I'm looking at that from a chemical standpoint. If I co-expose the embryos to benzoylpyrene and the CYP1A inhibitor, fluoranthine, and I'm also looking at the adaptive population. So what happens if I expose the ER embryos that are refractory, refractory to CYP1 induction? So to measure CYP1 activity, we have established um, an ANOVO ERAD assay. And so this assay, um, we expose the fish to ethoxyresorufin along with our compound of interest, and CYP1 enzyme can then cut off that ethylene group, leaving resorufin, which is fluorescent. And then we can measure the fluorescent. This is the bladder of the embryo. We can measure fluorescence in the bladder of the embryo um, and still look at the deformities in the same embryo. So in this graph, I'm sh I have Kings Creek, a reference site fish, that I've exposed to benzoylpyrene and either z zero parts per billion um, fluoranthine or 500 parts per billion. And here you can see that there is a large induction of CYP1 activity in all of the reference site, embryo reference site embryos um, exposed to benzoylpyrene. However, fluoranthine inhibits this induction. And so the Elizabeth River fish now are shown in the green and yellow bars, and you can see that um, in the presence and absence of fluoranthine at every dose of benzoylpyrene, they do not induce CYP1A. Now looking at cardiac deformities, in the King's Creek fish just exposed to benzoylpyrene, they show only mild levels of deformities at the highest concentration of BAP examined. However, when you co-expose them with the CYP1A inhibitor, there's a huge spike in deformities. And so this is just a picture of, this is an, a King's Creek fish exposed to 200 parts per billion BAP, and the heart is fairly normal, while a King's Creek fish co-exposed to BAP and fluoranthine, there is um, very little blood flow, and again, you get this stringy heart. Um, so when you add the Elizabeth River fish, as again shown by the red and the yellow bars, they do not show any deformities at any of um, the doses that we examined. So looking at the metabolism of BAP, we did not see any difference in um, the fish co-exposed to fluoranthine in how they 
got rid of VAP, benzoylpyrene. However, the Elizabeth River fish did show that they held on to VAP longer than the Kings Creek fish. And these fish also created um, a significantly um, higher amount of one of the metabolites of VAP, one of the um, less toxic metabolites of VAP, which is VAP 910-diol, suggesting that these fish have adapted by shifting their metabolism down an alternate pathway. So in summary, um, looking at the chemical analysis, Kings Creek embryos showed increased cardiac deformities after co-exposure to benzoylpyrene and fluoranthine. However, interestingly, fluoranthine did not show any significant effect on BAP metabolism. In the adaptive population, the Elizabeth River fish did not show any cardiac deformities after any treatment, and they did metabolize BAP slower than the Kings Creek fish and produced a greater amount of one of the more benign um, metabolites. And so I'd like to thank um, the DiGiulio Lab at Duke University and the Meyerhoff Program and the Nicholas School for the Environment um, at Duke University. And with that, I can take any questions. Yes, so the, the concentrations that I used were environmentally relevant concentrations, which really leads us to um, the biggest question of our lab is that, you know, a lot of times when people study these compounds, they study them individually. However, in the environment, like in the Elizabeth River, they occur together. And so we wanted to expose these fish to a mixture that they are likely to see in the environment in concentrations that they're likely to see. And we can see that there's a huge synergistic um, effect of exposing them to both compounds. Um, so you don't, you wouldn't be able to predict the toxicity just by thinking of the toxicity of benzoylpyrene alone or fluoranthine alone. Um, you wouldn't be able to predict what would happen if you put them both together. There are some um, compounds that these fish, you know, sometimes you'll hear um, PCBs or dioxins in fish would absolutely cause a problem. These PAHs usually don't, are not thought to cause a problem because they're metabolized really, really quickly in the fish. However, we see now that there's this adaptive population which don't seem to be, they're living in this for a long time and don't seem to be metabolizing it as quickly. So it could be a concern maybe in those fish, but in general, PAHs are not considered um, a problem when you eat fish because they get rid of them really fast. So that was the kind of goal was to figure out maybe what the what the different metabolites were being formed and then just expose the fish to those particular metabolites. And so that's kind of a next phase of the project. So the, the site has yet to be cleaned up, and this happened in 1990, and these concentrations are still there, um, at, at pretty much at the same level now that it's 2008. And so they do get biodegraded uh, by bacteria, but the, the extent of the spill was so, such, on such a large scale that it's had some problems. And then also, you know, they're in the sediment. Some of these are also f degraded um, using UV, but because they're in the sediment, they're not really that exposed to light. And so some people are looking at kind of the bioremediation of the site, what's kind of happening, what bacteria might break these down. So is the super fun still active? It, it, well, that's the, the, you know, that's the point of the, they have, they're, they're, you know, they go through phases and they're trying to figure it out. And I'm kind of happy that they haven't decided to clean it up until I've graduated, right, <laughs> until I finish. But um, <laughs> they're, they're, um, they have a proposal, but it's just so expensive, and it's the question of what's the best thing to do, and they're, they're still working it out.